All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you back uh, for our keynote address. Uh, and it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Professor Rebecca Eisenberg, uh, the Robert and Barbara Luciano Professor of Law at the University of Michigan School of Law. Uh, she is a Stanford University graduate and a graduate of University of California, Berkeley, Bolt Hall, uh, Bolt Hall School of Law. Uh, what you won't know is uh, she's also, uh, well, she's been one of my favorite patent scholars and IP scholars since I started in this. Uh, because, I mean, when she, she comes with an understanding and expertise in science and is able to communicate that to lay people, which I'm not technically, uh, but, uh, uh, but to lawyers and the public in a very clear and understandable way. Uh, and so for a little while, it was, you were not only someone I really enjoyed your work with, but you were the bane of my existence because when I was at Seton Hall, we were tasked with hiring uh, a patent law professor to fill out our IP curriculum. And they insisted, we want someone who can do law and patents and be a hard scientist. And so they, they insisted on P. PhDs in chemistry, <laughs> organic chemistry, and, and all these other wonderful disciplines. And I said, OK, but you do understand that there are very few people that will write and come from that background who will also be interested in broad policy questions and philosophy and, and work all of that into the legal discussion. And, and I think Professor Eisenberg is, is really a gem in the sense that she's been able to accomplish all of that. And also, um, in recent years, turned Michigan through the recruiting at the University of Michigan into perhaps one of the preeminent uh, intellectual property institutions in the country. Uh, so it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Eisenberg. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great introduction. Um, so I have these really uh, lame visual aids after seeing the uh, much better uh, presentations this morning, but I do have a little PowerPoint set here. Anyhow, I'm very honored to be um, uh, invited to give this lecture uh, at this very interesting and, and timely uh, symposium. And I want to use this opportunity to engage a topic that for uh, much of my career I've been fending off questions about, um, uh, and that is patentable subject matter. It's no longer possible to simply say that's behind us. Uh, this is a topic that appeared to be relatively settled for uh, inventions in, in the life sciences for most of my career until just a few years ago. Um, after the Supreme Court upheld the patentability of a living organism in its uh, uh, 1980 decision in Diamond versus Chakrabarty, patentable subject matter limitations just faded into the background as a concern for uh, uh, patent lawyers and in investors in the, in the biopharmaceutical industry. There were a few more wrinkles to be worked out, uh, such as the uh, you know, availability of utility patents for plants and, uh, and for animals, for that matter. Um, and these issues were quite stirring for the general public, um, uh, but uh, uh, they were not really a great source of uncertainty um, uh, within the, the patent field. The, the uh, PTO and the courts, for the most part, took it for granted uh, that new advances in biotechnology were within patentable subject matter, uh, and the devil seemed to be in the details of applying patent law standards uh, to these inventions and figuring out whether they were anticipated or obvious or useful or adequately described or enabled or uh, uh, whatever. Yet, I gotta say, throughout the years, uh, of, uh, in, in which I've been lecturing about uh, patent law in biomedical research, there is probably no question that I have heard more often and persistently than how can genes be patentable subject matter? Um, uh, it, you know, and of course, patentable subject matter in modern pat uh, patent law discourse is just, you know, refers not to all of the rules and standards that determine whether an inventor can get a patent, but it's just this categorical inquiry into whether the invention is the sort of thing that might be patented, assuming it meets all the other standards for patent protection, or if instead it's going to be categorically excluded uh, from the patent system because of the kind of thing it is. Uh, if the invention is within patentable subject matter, doesn't automatically get a patent, it still has to be examined to be sure that the invention meets the tests for novelty, utility, non-obviousness, adequate disclosure. Uh, et cetera, but if the uh, subject matter is categorically outside the patent system, it doesn't matter whether the invention meets these other tests at all. Um, now, the 1952 Patent Act 
for the first time, put a separate uh, patentable subject matter provision into the statute, although it drew from language that had been um, in the Patent Act all along. And it defines um, uh, patentable subject matter uh, uh, in, in, a, uh, in a way that doesn't really quite capture the exclusions from patentable subject matter. It defines the subject matter of patents broadly as any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter. Um, but there have been other limitations that have appeared over the years in the case law, both before and after uh, the uh, 1952 Act. The courts have traditionally excluded certain kinds of subject matter from patent protection, even though they might seem to fall within these broad categories. So when I first started teaching patent law, for example, I told my students, you can't patent mathematical algorithms, medical and surgical techniques, business methods, printed matter, products of nature. None of these is anywhere in the statutory language, of course. Um, uh, and uh, some of these exclusions that, that looked like they were settled black letter law back in the day um, have since that time been expressly repudiated by the courts. Um, uh, the direction of change until recently has been consistently towards expansion rather than restriction. It's been uh, uh, eliminating apparent exclusions that were never codified. Um, uh, sometimes that people assumed were there, uh, sometimes that had been mentioned in prior uh, cases. Um, uh, so until the last few years, the scope of patent eligible subject matter seemed to be steadily expanding as one categorical exclusion after another was first challenged and then disavowed uh, uh, by the courts. But most of the action was in the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Um, uh, and there were still these older decisions of the Supreme Court never overturned, uh, that seemed to take a more restrictive approach to patentable subject matter, potentially. Although it's a little hard to align them because these older decisions articulate restrictions that are different than the crisp subject matter exclusions uh, that the Federal Circuit has been eliminating. Uh, the old cases speak in broad generalities about how you can't patent laws of nature, natural phenomena, abstract ideas, products of nature, mental processes, abstract intellectual concepts. Um, they may offer some specific examples of things you can't patent. In fact, they offer the same ones over and over again. You can't patent E equals MC squared. You can do a search in LexisNexis. You'll draw up a bunch of opinions. Uh, you can't patent gravity, the heat of the sun. Um, and then the opinions reciting this list would then conclude that by the same token, you can't patent, say, a method for updating an alarm limit in the startup of a catalytic conversion plant as if that were clearly another member of this set. Um, uh, uh, they also repeatedly would deny any intention to embrace a crisp categorical exclusion, uh, such as, you know, you can't patent computer implemented inventions or computer software. Um, so there's a bunch of these old cases, particularly culminating in the 1970s when the Supreme Court was deciding quite a few, that do not present these crisp, bright line rules, but instead broad guidelines as to the kinds of things that are outside the scope of patentable subject matter. And it's not always easy to figure out how to apply these broad exclusions uh, to new kinds of inventions. Um, and one problem, I think, is that the, the, the courts have never developed a story about what work uh, the doctrine of patentable subject matter is doing for the patent system beyond the work done by the other requirements for patent protection, such as novelty, uh, non-obviousness, and, and the disclosure uh, requirements. In fact, some of the older cases, the pre-1952 cases, um, that sometimes get cited for establishing uh, limitations on patentable subject matter can easily be recast as based on some other limitation, uh, such as lack of novelty or obviousness or failure to uh, distinguish what is claimed 
Um, uh, um, and it's only since the 1952 Patent Act that the topic of patentable subject matter has had its own section in the statute, making it you know, hard to figure out sometimes just what these earlier decisions are about, whether it's patentable subject matter um, or something else. But plainly, there's some post-1952 Supreme Court decisions uh, that are written as if the, the court thinks it's up to something more grand and important than simply applying rules about prior art uh, or disclosure or specificity of claim language. Um, uh, so the result has been some uncertainty um, uh, and for a while lots of appellate litigation, particularly about computer implemented inventions. Uh, but then in the 1980s, the Supreme Court just changed course. Um, uh, after upholding the patentability of a living organism in Diamond versus Chakrabarty, 5-4, but it was marked a change of an era. Uh, it marked uh, no more Justice Douglas on the Supreme Court. Uh, 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 and then uh, a year later, upholding a uh, patent on a computer implemented method for calculating the cure time for uh, uh, molded rubber articles in Diamond versus Deer. Um, uh, they seemed to retire from the business of policing uh, uh, the subject matter boundaries of the patent system. Um, and the PTO sort of gave up the fight. Uh, so there wasn't the same stream of cases going up to the Supreme Court that there had been before. Now, the Supreme Court in Chakrabarty and Deere, uh, they never repudiated those earlier cases. They distinguished them, um, although perhaps not in a way that careful readers would find satisfactory. Um, uh, but after that, they just fell silent on the topic of, of patentable subject matter. Meanwhile, Congress created the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in 1983 uh, to hear all appeals in in patent cases in the hope of bringing greater predictability and uniformity uh, to the interpretation of the patent laws. Um, uh, they created this court out of the Court of Customs and Patent Appeals, which had previously only been hearing appeals from the PTO, same court, basically, with new Article III powers and expanded appellate jurisdiction. Um, and uh, the Federal Circuit in, in fits and starts gradually expanded the range of patentable subject matter by doing away with what was left of these bright line uh, categorical exclusions. And this trend reached a, uh, a, a peak in uh, the 1998 case of State Street Bank uh, versus Signature Financial Group. Um, uh, a case uh, that found patentable subject matter in an accounting system for pooling assets uh, from uh, uh, different mutual funds. Um, uh, and the Federal Circuit was untroubled by uh, the arguments that uh, uh, this should be excluded either as a, uh, a computer implemented algorithm or a business method. Um, uh, uh, they held that this was a, uh, a patentable, this is patentable subject matter because uh, uh, it is useful, concrete, and tangible, um, but it's not really tangible in the sense that you, you usually think of as tangible, something that you can sort of put in a box and shake and it'll make a noise. Um, uh, it was what they meant apparently by useful, concrete, and tangible was useful. Um, uh, and after that, it looked like it was all over. It looked like there were no remaining subject matter boundaries of any consequence in the patent system. And I started thinking I was going to be able to free up a week in my syllabus, uh, talk about other things. Then the Supreme Court reached out to take up the topic of patentable subject matter in a most extraordinary way in the case of Laboratory Corporation versus Metabolite Labs. Um, uh, the patent in the Metabolite case uh, claimed this method, a, a method of diagnosing vitamin deficiency, basically, by observing homocysteine levels and noticing whether they are uh, elevated. Um, and this is the precise uh, uh, claim language. Uh, the case was litigated, it was an infringement action that was litigated without challenge to whether it covered patentable subject matter. Um, but when it got to the Supreme Court, the court on its own initiative asked the parties for briefing on the question of whether the claims covered patentable subject matter or whether they impermissibly claimed a basic scientific relationship. Now this is highly unusual for the Supreme Supreme Court justices to raise on their own an issue that neither the parties uh, nor the lower courts have raised. Um, and it raised a lot of eyebrows in the biotechnology patent community. Um, because the claim in that case was like many other patent claims, as uh, uh, Bob Cook-Deegan was illustrating this morning. There's a whole lot of 
claims that look sort of like this, that are variations on this, this theme um, uh, that have issued on, on diagnostic methods that involve, you know, number one, observing some biological marker, and then number two, analyzing that, maybe comparing it to a reference value um, uh, uh, to make a diagnosis or to determine an appropriate course of treatment. Um, now, a majority of the court, of the Supreme Court, ultimately decided that, you know, gee, this case really hasn't been properly queued up here. It's not appropriate to uh, address the question of patent eligibility in this in the metabolite case without the benefit of the Federal Circuit's analysis. Um, uh, and so they dismissed the case. But there were three justices, uh, uh, Breyer, Souter, and Stevens, three out of nine Supreme Court justices, who thought that this case was such a no-brainer that they were ready to invalidate the patent on subject matter grounds without waiting for the benefit of the Federal Circuit's uh, views. They didn't feel like they needed the issue to percolate in the lower courts. Um, uh, uh, and according to these three dissenters, this claim improperly seeks to patent a basic scientific relationship between homocysteine levels and vitamin de deficiencies, and it's therefore unpatentable for the same reasons that preclude the patenting of E equals MC squared or the heat of the sun. Um, now, this is a dissenting opinion, and of course, the dissenting opinions are not law, but this was still an interesting uh, and em emphatic opinion, uh, clearer and more coherent, in my view, than many prior opinions of the Supreme Court on patentable subject matter. The three dissenters, speaking through Justice Breyer, clearly distinguished, for one thing, patentable subject matter from other requirements for patent protection. Um, uh, and uh, uh, they justified the exclusion of laws of nature and so forth from patentable subject matter as a way to preserve free access to the building blocks of future research. Uh, it was a very appealing argument. Um, uh, and you can see this quotation here that I don't need to read to you. You can read it to yourself. Um, uh, uh, so anyhow, they were recognizing the difficulty of defining categories like phenomena of nature, mental processes, abstract intellectual concepts, but they nonetheless figured this case isn't even close to the boundary. They saw the correlation between homocysteine levels and vitamin deficiency as a natural phenomenon. The fact that the claim also required processing a tissue sample to measure the homocysteine level was not enough to turn the analysis of this natural correlation into a patentable process. Um, now, the author of this opinion, Justice Breyer, is still sitting on the Supreme Court. But the two justices who joined him, Justice Stevens and Justice Souter, are both gone from that court. Um, uh, although Justice Stevens was still on the court long enough to cast a vote and to write a concurring opinion uh, in the Bilski case uh, uh, last summer. But it's interesting to me, and you know, everybody's talking about Bilski. Um, and you know, Bilski, of course, it, is a decision, an actual decision uh, with a holding and so forth, uh, whereas this isn't. But it's interesting to me that it was this diagnostic method patent ra uh, rather than a business method patent that caught the Supreme Court's eye, that brought its attention back to the issue of patent eligibility um, in LabCorp versus Metabolite. You know, business method patents have been far more controversial and are of far more dubious value in promoting innovation uh, than diagnostic method patents, and they've been a much bigger problem for the business community. We heard this morning, and I don't mean to minimize the problems uh, that have arisen with diagnostic patents, but they haven't generated anything like uh, the opposition that, that business method patents have, have, have attracted. Business method ha patents have been so despised that they've even uh, uh, generated Wall Street Journal editorials against them. And the Wall Street Journal is usually a big champion of property rights of all sorts. Um, uh, so, uh, so but, the, but business methods, of course, are not fundamental building blocks, right? Um, uh, the, you know, the, it's not the same, it doesn't make the same poster child for this kind of argument that Justice Breyer was making in saying uh, we got a patentable subject matter uh, uh, problem. 
Um, okay, so Breyer's opinion again, dissenting opinion from a decision to dismiss a ca the case from further Supreme Court review, not binding authority on any issue, but it was an alarm bell that shook up the federal circuit, signaled that its expansive approach to patentable subject matter uh, uh, might be vulnerable to reversal by the Supreme Court in an appropriate case. Um, and. Uh, uh, the fact that it got three votes under these extraordinary circumstances is really quite amazing. Um, you know, it might not seem like much, especially now that two of them are gone. Um, but three votes, you know, when the case was not, a, you know, when it, it, cert was plainly improvidently granted. You know, the, the Federal Circuit hadn't even addressed the issue. Uh, surely two people might have been moved by the fact that the Federal Circuit hadn't addressed the issue, even if they thought Justice Breyer's analysis was brilliant. Uh, so it didn't seem outside the realm of possibility that a properly queued up case could get a majority uh, for invalidity. And this case followed a series of actually unanimous reversals of Federal Circuit doctrine by the Supreme Court. And so I think the Federal Circuit was quite worried that patentable subject matter uh, was next uh, and that they better dust off those old opinions about products of nature, natural phenomena, et cetera, and figure out what it was uh, that they were saying. Uh, meanwhile, the PTO, which had, I think, been discouraged after a series of losses in the Supreme Court from entering uh, rejections on, under Section 101, started entering more patentable subject matter reje uh, rejections. They were emboldened. And so that created some disgruntled patent applicants who appealed to the Federal Circuit. And again, there was a flow of appellate litigation that set the stage for Federal Circuit and Supreme Court review. <coughs> so the first of these cases, <coughs> to reach the Supreme Court was Bilski versus Kapos. And Bilski's patent application was on a business method, uh, specifically this method of uh, hedging risks against price fluctuations in commodities trading or something like that. Uh, uh, the PTO rejected this claim for lack of patentable subject matter. Bilski appealed. Uh, the Federal Circuit had by this time issued a couple of other opinions affirming rejections for lack of patentable subject matter, which was something they hadn't been doing for many years prior to that time, although with some inconsistency in their analytical approach. Uh, and so that left a lot of confusion as to the applicable rules. So they decided to hear the Bilski case on bank, use it as an opportunity to clarify the law on patentable subject matter. Um, now, the Federal Circuit, I think, takes very seriously its mandate to bring about greater clarity and predictability in the field of patent law. And so they like bright line legal rules um, uh, that point towards clear outcomes in future cases. And they really don't like broad, open-ended principles that require the exercise of judgment on a case-by-case -case basis and on which uh, reasonable lines uh, can differ. This is one reason why they keep getting reversed, I think. The Supreme Court likes broad, flexible, open-ended principles, and the Federal Circuit didn't want to be reversed again. So they really were in quite a bind here. So they worked their way through all the old uh, Supreme Court cases with their vague but rhetorically compelling uh, standards and tried to figure out how can we operationalize these standards in a bright line predictable rule. And so they came up with a test for patentable subject matter that they thought unified the Supreme Court's previously announced exclusions for laws of nature, physical phenomena, and abstract ideas. Um, they held that a process claim is eligible, subject matter eligible for, for patent protection if one, it is tied to a particular machine or apparatus, or two, it transforms a particular article into a different state or thing. So this uh, so-called machine or transformation test um, anchored patentable subject matter for processes in the physical material world. Um, Bilski's risk hedging method didn't qualify under that machine or transformation standard, and so they affirmed uh, uh, the rejection. Um, uh, people didn't like the machine or transformation test. Some people liked it, some people didn't like it. 
Um, perhaps its greatest virtue is that it renders invalid a lot of claims like Bilski's. Uh, uh, many business method claims are going to fall under that test, although you can always say with the aid of a computer or something like that, I suppose, to get around it. Um, but it also threatened to take down other method patents that are arguably doing more to promote innovation, such as diagnostic method patents, perhaps. Um, and there's a bunch of these cases that are working their way through the system, uh, and a, a, a couple of them have already been decided by the Federal Circuit. Um, uh, one that Bob mentioned earlier and said that I was going to say something about, I'm not going to say much about it, but I'll throw up a slide, uh, is this, uh, this claim in, in Klassen versus Biogen. Um, uh, uh, in this case, the Federal Circuit affirmed a trial court this came right on the heels of the Federal Circuit's own adoption of the machine or transformation test in its Bilski opinion, the one that the Supreme Court later reviewed. And uh, uh, the Federal Circuit affirmed the trial court's holding invalid of this, of this claim. Uh, 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 the method involves uh, uh, immunizing a treatment group and comparing the incidence of chronic immune-mediated disorders in the treatment group relative to a tr control group that was not immunized in order to see if there's any correlation between immunization and chronic immune-mediated disorders. Um, the trial court concluded that this claim it was seeking to patent an unpatentable natural phenomenon and held the patent invalid. I'm not sure if that's really the right way to think about it. It's trying to patent a research protocol, basically. Uh, anyhow, in a very brief opinion, the Federal Circuit affirmed, uh, uh, they simply stated in like a paragraph in an unpublished opinion, which we're not supposed to cite unpublished opinions, um, but I'm not, I'm just putting up the, the claim. Um, uh, it, it, the Federal Circuit said that uh, the patent claims don't pass muster under the machine or transformation test uh, because they were neither tied to a particular machine or apparatus, nor did they transform a particular article into a different state or thing. Uh, so Dr. Klassen appealed to the Supreme Court. And then in another post-Bilski claim, um, uh, case, uh, Prometheus versus Mayo Collaborative Services, uh, the Federal Circuit came out the other way. Uh, uh, they reversed a district court decision that had invalidated a diagnostic method patent under the uh, uh, Bilski machine or transformation test. Um, uh, there are, you know, as is often the case, there's a bunch of different claims that are slightly different. Um, uh, but basically, they, uh, all the claims began with the, uh, you know, a method of optimizing therapeutic efficacy uh, for treatment of an immune-mediated gastrointestinal disorder, um, uh, comprising a series of steps. Um, uh, in other words, rather than uh, reciting a purely diagnostic method, the Prometheus claims are reciting a method of optimizing treatment and embedding the diagnostic moves within that method. Um, uh, 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 the, the steps for performing that method in, in most of the claims included both, you know, what we see here, A, an, an administering step, a step of administering um, uh, a, a drug to a patient, um, uh, and then uh, a second step, B, of determining uh, the level uh, of metabolites in the, in the patient's blood to determine whether the dose was, was too high or too low. Um, uh, although some of the claims omitted to recite the administering step and just went straight to the step of determining uh, uh, the, uh, the, the level of the metabolite. Um, uh, and the Federal Circuit concluded that either or both of these steps, uh, the administering the drug step and the determining the metabolite levels uh, step, uh, uh, was enough to satisfy the machine or transformation test. Giving a drug to a patient causes all sorts of uh, uh, transformations in the patient's body, and determining the metabolite levels, uh, that involves uh, you know, getting a tissue sample and subjecting it to chemical analysis that, uh, that brings about physical and chemical changes in, in, in the tissue samples that are drawn from the patient. Uh, so that was good enough uh, to satisfy the machine or transformation test in the view of that panel. And so the Mayo Clinic, like Klassen and like Bilski, appealed to the Supreme Court. Um, and Bilski is the one who succeeded in getting the attention of the, um, uh, of the Supreme Court. 
Um, and his, his patent claimed a business method rather than a diagnostic method. Um, but plainly, the Supreme Court was aware that diagnostic methods are lurking on the horizon. There were many amicus briefs that were filed in this case, alerting them to the potential problems posed by the machine or transformation test in the uh, diagnostics industry. Um, uh, um, now, I've called this a majority opinion because it's got five justices signing on to portions of it. In fact, this was a unanimous opinion. The justices were all in agreement that Bilski's claim uh, was invalid, uh, but they didn't agree on why not. Um, uh, there were three different opinions, and only one opinion commanded a majority and only as to a part of its reasoning. Um, uh, the justices sound a lot more insecure in their Bilski opinions than they sounded in the older cases. They seemed not to want to say any more than was absolutely necessary uh, to uh, uh, resolve this case about patentable subject matter. Um, uh, but they had different ideas about how to narrow their holding, and so they couldn't sign on to the same narrow opinion. Interestingly, they divide up, in this case, according to their usual ideological divide, which is not something they usually do in IP cases. More commonly, either they're in agreement in the IP cases or you know, there's some strange bedfellows alliances among, uh, 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 across the usual uh, uh, ideological divide. So in this case, there was a uh, conservative justices plurality opinion authored by Justice Kennedy, um, uh, joined by Justices Roberts, Alito, and Thomas, with Justice Scalia uh, joining portions of the opinion to provide a majority as to some of the things that, that it said. And then we have a... Uh, uh, liberal plurality opinion authored by uh, 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 Justice Stevens, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, and uh, Sotomayor. Um, and then uh, Justice Breyer also wrote a separate opinion joined in part by Justice Scalia um, uh, to clarify a few things that he thought all of the justices agree on Although, perhaps the fact that the other seven justices weren't willing to sign on to this opinion uh, put some doubt into just how far they were all agreed even on, uh, on, on this. But anyhow, I'm going to go back here. Uh, let's start with the um, conservative, uh, the conservatives joined by Scalia. Um, uh, uh, they began by noting that prior Supreme Court opinions had provided three specific exclusions um, uh, uh, or exceptions to patentable subject matter for laws of nature, physical phenomena, and abstract ideas. Um, they rejected the Federal Circuit's machine or transformation test as the exclusive test for patentability of processes. They thought that was inconsistent with the statutory text, um, uh, noting that the words of the statute should be construed in accordance with their ordinary contemporary common meaning without reading any unexpressed limitations into the language. There's nothing about business methods in section 101. Later in the opinion, they, uh, they indicated uh, that the machine or transformation test, although not the exclusive test for patentable subject matter, is a useful and important clue uh, to patentability. Uh, and they rejected a categorical exclusion for business methods, um, uh, noting that uh, such an exclusion was inconsistent with the statutory text. And, then this, and this, at this point, they included um, a reference to 1999 amendments uh, that Congress passed uh, following the State Street Bank decision in order to provide a defense for prior users of later patented business rights. Usually under US patent law, if you are using an invention as a trade secret and somebody else independently invents the same thing and patents it, they can stop you from using that. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, as a sort of a quick patch following State Street Bank, they enacted prior user rights to protect businesses from that. Uh, from that outcome. Uh, that led the majority to say, well, you see, if Congress passed a special defense for infringement of business method patents, they must have thought business methods were patentable. Um, uh, interesting analysis that the uh, liberals took exception to. Um, uh, and then in portions of the um, opinion that uh, Justice Scalia didn't join, um, uh, and therefore that did not command a majority, the conservative plurality said that um, uh, you know, maybe machine or transformation test, business methods exclusion, maybe these rules made sense 
for industrial age technologies, um, uh, but they will no longer do for new information age technologies. Um, and we've got to construe the subject matter provisions of the Patent Act in a dynamic fashion in order to keep pace uh, uh, with the times. Now, this is not the usual move for these justices who more typically like to stick with original uh, uh, meanings. Um, and then reflecting back concerns that had been expressed in, in amicus briefs, uh, they noted in particular that the machine or transformation test would create uncertainty as to the patentability of software, advanced diagnostic medicine techniques, uh, and inventions based on linear programming, data compression, and the manipulation of digital signals. So this just reads like a little shout out to some of their amicus briefs, right? Uh, we hear you, uh, we're not going to go there. Um, uh, but they didn't explain what they meant by that, and they, didn't, and they denied that we're promising that we won't do that in the future. Um, uh, then, writing separately, uh, the liberal justices uh, plurality agreed with both the decision to, the aff to affirm and with the uh, conservatives' disapproval of the machine or transformation test as the exclusive test of a patentable process. They also agreed that the machine or transformation test is a critical clue uh, to patentable subject matter. Um, but unlike the conservatives, the liberals would have endorsed a categorical exclusion from patentable subject matter for business methods. Um, and then in contrast to the conservative plurality's insistence that the Patent Act uh, has to be construed liberally to keep up with changing times in the information age, uh, the liberal plurality took an originalist approach. Uh, uh, they said, you know, business innovation is, uh, has been you know, happening forever, and it was never patented in the past, and surely this cannot be what the framers and, and prior congresses had in mind when they said you can patent a process. Um, so it's as if the liberals and conservatives switched their usual talking points uh, uh, in this case, with the uh, conservatives willing to you know, revisit old understandings, update them for uh, the information age, uh, the liberals stressing uh, uh, original meanings. I take this as a sign of just how totally discombobulated they were uh, by this case and how uh, fearful they were of saying uh, uh, the wrong thing. Um, and then finally, we have Justice Breyer joined by Scalia highlighting that he thinks everybody agrees that Bilski's claims cover unpatentable abstract ideas, which none of them defines, uh, that the machine or transformation test is an important clue, but not the exclusive test for patentable subject matter, uh, and that the Federal Circuit's prior approach, as expressed in the State Street Bank decision of extending patentable subject matter to anything that is useful, concrete, and tangible, is not good law. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, in fact, they all agree, um, uh, but uh, 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 I think there's probably a majority that would agree with all of those things, at least. So anyhow, having thus disposed of the Bilski case, uh, the Supreme Court remanded the cases of Klassen versus Biogen and Prometheus versus Mayo back to the Federal Circuit for reconsideration in light of their decision in Bilski. Um, uh, overall reaction to, uh, in, in the patent com community, the Bilski decision, I think, was that it changed much less than had been speculated in advance. Um, and that perhaps this actually was shifting the, um, uh, uh, the law back from where the Federal Circuit had left it with its machine or transformation test um, uh, towards a more expansive notion of patent eligibility than that represented. Um, uh, that is, to the extent that they didn't like machine or transformation, it seemed that they were saying, that's too tough. That excludes too much. What about the diagnostic methods and the computer software? Uh, uh, so anyhow, uh, uh, last month, the uh, Federal Circuit revisited its decision in Prometheus versus Mayo after remand from the Supreme Court following the Bilski decision. Um, and they essentially doubled down, as Bob Deacon was saying this morning, they, on, their, on their prior opinion. They again applied the machine or transformation test to conclude that the claims are patentable. Uh, they said the Supreme Court said that's a clue. In this case, we think that clue is the uh, the beginning and end of the analysis, um, uh, 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 and uh, 
uh, so it, since the claims pass the machine or transformation test, uh, uh, the Federal Circuit panel concluded that the claims are drawn not to a natural phenomenon itself, uh, but rather to a, an application, a, a specific application of a natural phenomenon. Um, uh, now, one thing that's a little odd about this is the, um, you can't tell it from this slide, which actually I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, they treat this as a problem of uh, whether this is a, 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 an unpatentable natural phenomenon rather than whether it's an abstract idea. The uh, Bilski Supreme Court decision says machine or transformation, that's an important clue to whether something is an abstract idea, uh, not necessarily um, uh, whether it's a natural phenomenon. Maybe we need a different clue if the issue is whether this is a claim to a natural uh, a phenomenon. Or perhaps the exclusion category that is most appropriate for evaluating patentable subject matter in Prometheus is neither abstract idea uh, nor natural phenomenon, but rather mental process. Um, uh, I could go back to that old slide, but then I'll never find my place again. Anyhow, the Prometheus claims here are, oh, yeah, let me go back to the claim. Uh, the Prometheus claims here are um, an example of what Professor Kevin Collins calls a determine and infer claim of which there are a great many. These claims involve determining some measurable medical fact or biomarker uh, for an individual and then inferring some conclusion about something else, about the individual's health or diagnosis or disease state um, or uh, adequacy of uh, their drug dosage um, uh, based on that marker. Um, uh, and typically, what really makes the invention useful is the inference that you're drawing. That's the whole point. Um, and perhaps that's what distinguishes it from the prior art. Um, now, Judge Lurie recognizes this mental steps problem. Um, uh, uh, that the exclusion from mental processes might be a problem. He says here, we agree with the district court that the final wherein clauses in the claim are mental steps and thus not patent eligible per se. However, they alone are not patent eligible. The, the, uh, uh, the claims are not simply uh, to the mental steps. A subsequent mental step does not by itself negate the transformative nature of prior steps. Thus, when viewed in the proper context, the final step of providing a warning uh, does not detract from the patentability of Prometheus's claimed methods as a whole. No claim in the Prometheus patents claims only mental steps. In other words, so long as the claim includes some step that satisfies the machine <coughs> transformation test, it doesn't matter that the claim also includes uh, a mental step. Uh, for Judge Lurie. Now this analysis is quite different, you may recall, from that of the three dissenting Supreme Court justices in LabCorp versus Metabolite. That claim, remember, also included a you know, transformative process step to detect homocysteine levels, um, which requires taking a blood sample and subjecting it to chemical uh, processing. And the patent holder argued that that was enough to make it an application of a law of nature rather than uh, a claim to the natural correlation itself. Itself, but the dissenting justices were completely unpersuaded by that argument. According to Justice Breyer, the claim instructs the user to, one, obtain test results, and two, think about them. Why should it matter if the test results themselves were obtained through an unpatented pr procedure that involved the transformation of blood? Claim 13 is indifferent to that fact, for it tells the user to use any test at all. Um, uh, uh, aside from the unpatented test, they embody only the correlation between homocysteine and vitamin deficiency that the researchers uncovered. In my view, that correlation is an unpatentable natural phenomenon, and I can find nothing in Claim 13 that adds anything more of significance. Um, uh, and Judge Lurie, you know, this is, language was cited back to Judge Lurie. Judge Lurie dismisses it in a footnote where he says, with respect, we decline to discuss a dissent. It is not controlling law, and it involved different claims from the ones at issue here. Um, uh, now, uh, he's right, of course, it's a dissent, it's not the law, but had he taken LabCorp seriously rather than refusing to discuss it, perhaps he could have distinguished it. I don't know ultimately that that would have been um, 
it, that it was, I don't know that it was necessary and I don't know that it ultimately would have been successful, but you could argue that the claim in LabCorp uh, was about diagnosis of a natural condition. Uh, while the claim in Prometheus is about getting the proper drug dosage. Um, uh, uh, so the LabCorp claim recited a purely diagnostic observation, while the Prometheus claims recite a method of optimizing treatment. The steps for performing that method, the Prometheus method, include, in most claims at least, administering a, a, a drug to a patient. Um, uh, uh, and even in the case, the, the the claims that don't recite that, that's the whole point of the claim, is to get the right drug dosage. Um, is that a distinction that matters for purposes of patentable subject matter? Well, we don't have the benefit of anybody's analysis of that, really. Um, uh, uh, but I think you could, you could probably spin out an argument that the observation of metabolites that are a byproduct of drug treatments uh, is uh, uh, more unnatural uh, than the observation of homocysteine levels in, in, in a patient who may or may not have a vitamin uh, a deficiency. I think, but even if we could distinguish those two claims in terms of whether they are natural or whether they are uh, embedded within some overarching human intervention that, that, that changes their character, um, uh, 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 it, it's a separate question whether that distinction matters for purposes of patentable subject matter, right? Whether it makes either of these claims more or less of a basic building block. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, anyhow, the, mo the molecular diagnostics industry basically likes this decision. Uh, 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 but there are more cases pending before the Federal Circuit, and different panels could potentially go in different directions. Of course, the big case that everybody's wondering about, one that's been briefed, uh, uh, but uh, 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 we're still, uh, we, we may have to wait a while before we get a decision, um, is uh, the ACLU challenge to the patents on the BRCA1 and 2 breast cancer susceptibility genes controlled by Myriad Genetics. Um, uh, as as uh, Bob Cook Deegan was explaining uh, this morning, uh, Myriad and its practices have become the something of a you know the the bad boy of the DNA diagnostics industry. Um, uh, they are uh, uh, held up as the shining example of the evils of gene patenting, um, uh, and uh, so uh, the ACLU had no difficulty finding people who may or may not have standing to challenge the validity uh, of these patents. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, specifically, they challenged uh, a bunch of different claims that are all different, and I'm not going to put them all up. There are method claims like this one, um, uh, a uh, method of comparing or analyzing human DNA samples to detect alterations or, or mutations corresponding to increased susceptibility uh, to breast cancer, and they also challenged claims to isolated DNA. Um, uh, and the district court in um, New York granted summary judgment of invalidity last spring before the Supreme Court's decision in Bilski came down. Uh, and the district court held that the claims to isolated DNA are unpatentable products of nature um, because they are not markedly different from the naturally occurring DNA and uh, that the method claims are invalid because they flunk the machine or transformation test, uh, uh, which had not yet been uh, uh, at all discredited at this point. Um, uh, so Myriad has appealed that decision to the Federal Circuit. Many amicus briefs have been filed. What will the Federal Circuit do? Well, let's start with the diagnostic method claims, because I think we have a little bit more guidance as to how they might handle those. Um, uh, remember, the, the district court relied on the machine or transformation test for holding these claims invalid. The Supreme Court has now said, well, that's an important clue, but it's not the only test of patentable subject matter for processes. So it's possible, in other words, that even if the, the claim does flunk, the machine or transformation test, that it is still uh, patentable because that's only a clue, right? Um, uh, and in fact, the uh, majority 
signaled one thing we don't like about the machine or transformation test is it might bring down, you know, might have untoward consequences for other things, including diagnostic methods. Um, uh, now, the Federal Circuit has indicated in Prometheus that it likes the machine or transformation test. Uh, at least it liked it for evaluating the Prometheus claims. Perhaps they will affirm the district court on the machine or transformation test, or maybe they'll say that the uh, district court misapplied that test. Maybe they will say that there was, too, a transformative step in the BRCA uh, uh, claims. Um, uh, Myriad argued that there was because you can't analyze a DNA sequence uh, 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 without taking a DNA sample and subjecting it to transformative chemical processes, just like you can't measure the metabolites in a drug without uh, uh, taking a, 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 a sample. But the court didn't buy it. Uh, judge Sweet, um, the, district, the district court judge, said that the, the claim language doesn't include any steps that involve transformation of tissue samples. They just didn't recite that. Um, uh, they, they instead go straight to the abstract mental processes of comparing or analyzing uh, uh, gene sequences. And so on that basis, Judge Sweet, who had read the Federal Circuit's first opinion in Prometheus versus Mayo, um, uh, he distinguished that pre-Bilski opinion in Prometheus versus Mayo, um, uh, 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 saying that in Prometheus there was language about administering and, um, uh, 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 and determining uh, that uh, were construed to embrace um, uh, transformative processes. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so th th it may be a claims drafting issue that makes these method claims uh, uh, f f fail. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether that'll be uh, persuasive to the Federal Circuit, but even if they agree on the machine or transformation prong, um, uh, uh, they might still say that uh, uh, stepping beyond the machine or transformation test, which is only a clue, uh, uh, this, this still, uh, 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 th th this process might, uh, uh, might still be either patentable as a, uh, 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 as, a, as, as a process or an unpatentable uh, ab abstract idea. Um, uh, unlike the claims in Prometheus, these claims aren't even arguably directed to a method of treatment. Um, uh, they don't include st any step of administering a drug to a patient. Their treatment is not the essential purpose of the, of, the, uh, of, of, of the method. The essential purpose is just to get information about a, a patient's breast cancer risk with no, no treatment recited in the claim. So the whole point of the exercise is, is diagnosis, uh, not treatment, which makes it seem more like observation and analysis of a natural condition and less like medical intervention, perhaps. Um, uh, but on the other hand, as a matter of policy, I'm not sure if there is any reason why we should want to distinguish uh, between diagnosis and treatment in setting the subject matter boundaries of the patent system. Of course, the Federal Circuit won't be asking itself that question. They don't really have room to ask themselves that question. They can't ask whether patents on diagnostic methods uh, are doing more harm than good or more good than harm because that's not a question that's committed to them. Um, uh, they have to figure out, is this claiming an abstract idea, a natural phenomenon, a mental step? Um, uh, 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 so uh, I, I, I think they have a lot of latitude, but I think these claims are vulnerable. I think these claims might well, that Judge Sweet is more likely to be affirmed with respect to the diagnostic method claims than with respect to the, uh, the, the product claims that have gotten all the attention. So much of these product claims gotten all the attention that the brief for the United States doesn't even mention the diagnostic method claims, which is quite shocking. Because um, uh, that's where they have some opportunity to really shape the law. Um, anyhow, a lot of people have focused on the claims of this character. Uh, briefly, Judge Sweet holds that an isolated and purified DNA molecule with the same nucleotide sequence as native DNA as it exists in human cells is a product of nature because it is not markedly different from the uh, native DNA sequence. Um, uh, 
Uh, indeed, what makes the isolated and purified DNA molecule useful is the very fact that it is identical to native DNA, um, and any differences are not sufficient to give the, the claimed molecules uh, a distinctive name, character, and use as required by Supreme Court precedents. Um, he dismisses an old case, you know, there's an old line of lower court cases um, uh, uh, that uh, have held that a purification of a naturally occurring substance uh, uh, may be pat patent eligible subject matter on the grounds that these are lower court decisions that are inconsistent with Supreme Court authorities. Um, um, uh, and uh, uh, Bilski provides relatively little guidance, I think, on how to address that issue. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, so there's more room for the Federal Circuit to uh, potentially to, to buy Judge Sweet's analysis or not. I wouldn't put a lot of money on the likelihood of affirmance on, on, uh, on this issue. Um, I, I think that there are um, potentially votes out there to affirm. It's possible if they got a, uh, a very friendly panel uh, uh, that they might affirm, but I think it's more likely that they will um, um, uh, that they will reverse Judge Sweet on this on this issue. Um, um, uh, uh, there are some aspects of Judge Sweet's decision that I think the Federal Circuit isn't going to like, and that I think the Supreme Court wouldn't like, for that matter. Uh, one thing he does is he makes an argument about. Uh, uh, DNA exceptionalism uh, that he really didn't need to do, and he went out of his way to say DNA is not just any chemical, DNA is an informational molecule, therefore we analyze this case in a different way than we would analyze cases about other chemicals. Uh, that's not the sort of argument that the Federal Circuit likes, um, uh, and even the, the Supreme Court has been avoiding field-specific subject matter limitations or exclusions. So I don't think they're gonna like a rule that rests on DNA being different from other chemicals because it's an informational molecule and therefore disfavored in the patent system. Also, there's a problem of you know, 30 years of reliance uh, from the uh, uh, biotech industry on the, uh, the patentability of DNA uh, molecules that I think would weigh quite heavily uh, on the, uh, the court. It's a little late in the day to uh, uh, disrupt those expectations. So I don't think that these isolated DNA claims are going to fail, but I agree that the, the, uh, um, uh, the method claims might, um, and, uh, and that that is a bigger deal. That is potentially a much bigger deal. Um, although it may be that what will happen is it'll be like it was with computer software in the 1980s, where you need to recite the magic words in your claim, uh, where you just need to put more stuff into the claim uh, that makes this look more like it is, uh, more, uh, like it is uh, a, a, t a tangible human intervention. Um, uh, now, it's a, what will happen when these cases get to the Supreme Court is harder to guess, although after Bilski, it seems uh, far less likely that they would embrace any broad categorical exclusion. Um, uh, um, uh, I'm kind of getting a little late here. So, so what should we want to see happen in these cases? Um, well, uh, there's a huge and interesting literature on the subject of patentable subject matter right now. A lot of really smart people have been approaching this in, 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 in different ways. Um, um, but I think what's missing from much of the debate is the question that I began with, which is what is the purpose of having subject matter boundaries to the patent system? I think if you could get some purchase on that question, that might help you figure out how should we interpret the limitations that we have. Um, uh, if we knew what we were trying to accomplish with subject matter boundaries, it might be easier to, easier to figure out where they belong. Um, and that's not the same as asking whether we want this patent to issue or don't want this patent to issue, because we have other doctrinal tools that can do some of that sorting for us. So what specifically is patentable subject matter doing for the patent system. Um, uh, some old cases characterize patentable subject matter as a threshold inquiry or the front door of the, uh, of the patent and trademark office providing a sort of a rough first cut um, uh, that uh, limits the range of inventions that then get into the PTO and need to be examined more closely uh, to determine their patentability. That makes a lot of sense administratively, um, uh, which is undoubtedly why the PTO has sometimes been a big proponent of subject matter boundaries uh, that allow it to uh, uh, bounce certain technologies out at the front door, uh, like software in the 1970s, um, uh, rather than otherwise having to hire a bunch of different personnel to examine these uh, 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 inventions in these field, but of course it's problematic to have a patent system that excludes new fields of technology from 
patent protection. Uh, the whole point of a patent system is to promote uh, the development of new technologies. And if path-breaking uh, innovations uh, in new fields need to you know, first go to Congress and then change the patent laws uh, before they can get protection, that adds another uh, layer of, of, of cost and uncertainty, um, uh, 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 which is, is bad for technological uh, advance. Um, uh, moreover, if that's the point, if you want to, if it's supposed to serve that front yard gatekeeper role, you need some sort of bright line rules that are easy for the bouncer to apply at the, at the front door. Um, uh, uh, and that's not what we have. In fact, we've been doing away with all our bright line rules. Uh, uh, Professor John Duffy has noted that the bright line exclusions uh, from patentable subject matter have not fared as well as the more generally worded standards. Uh, and he argues that the reason is that it's hard for bright line rules to keep up with technological uh, a change, um, and that's undoubtedly true. A slightly different point of subject matter boundaries that I think is actually important and I think is the reason why we're having so much trouble with the patent system right now is that subject matter boundaries limit the diversity of the uh, subject matter that's, that's trying to live under a unitary set of patent law rules. Um, uh, so we have this one size fits all patent system, but the more diverse the people that are trying to wear that same patent system, uh, uh, the harder it is for those, it, the more apparent it becomes that one size fits nobody, I suppose. Um, and, and you can see this happening. Um, so as the uh, post State Street Bank, you start seeing a lot more uh, uh, diversity in amicus briefs filed with the Supreme Court in patent law cases. Uh, uh, you see disagreements in legislative debates. Um, uh, I'm really, am I over time? Do I need to like wrap this up here? Any, uh, you see um, uh, you know, innovators in the, from the pharmaceutical industry arguing for stronger, more robust patent protection while people from IT and financial services are arguing for weaker patent rights to limit uh, uh, the power of trolls. Maybe a less diverse uh, community of innovators would have an easier time agreeing about what the rules should be like. Um, but again, if that's the purpose, uh, then the doctrine that we've been talking about doesn't make a, 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 a lot of sense. To, you know, to limit this sort of heterogeneity, you would want the sort of field exclusions that the courts have repeatedly rejected, um, uh, such as business methods, um, uh, uh, rather than vague standards that, that nobody knows how to apply. Moreover, you'd want to see a more deliberate economic analysis of the impact of patents in different fields of a sort that the courts don't engage in and, frankly, Congress doesn't engage in, um, uh, 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 rather than the, the present focus on criteria such as tangibility and abstractness and, and similarity to natural products that may be really largely irrelevant to those uh, economic considerations. Um, uh, uh, you know, Justice Breyer made an attractive argument Oh, end of slide, turn your mind. Uh, an attractive argument for exclusions of uh, laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas, uh, that these are excluding fundamental building blocks that are likely to be of value in future research paths. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense, I think, as a matter of public policy. But, uh, but it's not clear that exclusions from patentable subject matter is the best doctrinal tool even to accomplish that goal. Um, uh, you know, we have a utility requirement that already limits patentability to inventions with some practical utility. Uh, and if the goal is to provide a clear field for future researchers, as, as Bob Cook-Deacon was saying this morning, it might make more sense to have a research exemption from infringement liability rather than excluding the invention from patent protection entirely. That way you could allow the benefits of the patent system for uh, the the practical use of the invention as applied technology uh, without uh, interfering with, with, with future research. You know, unfortunately, none of this analysis is on display in the opinions of either the Supreme Court or the Federal Circuit. Um, instead, uh, patentable subject matter doctrine is being treated purely as a matter of stare decisis. What was it that we said in past years uh, with no policy moorings to guide the interpretations of these prior decisions? So for the moment, at least, uh, you know, adherence uh, to these prior decisions seems uh, uh, more like dead hand control than like uh, channeling the wisdom of the ages. So I'll stop there. Sorry I, I've taken up so much time. Well over. Thank you. Yes, Bob. So Becky, one direction that some of your earlier scholarship might have pushed you is, and you didn't talk about it, is whether you can patent information per se. Mm -hmm. Is that really what's going on, and why why hasn't that come out? Um, I think it, it has. It absolutely has come out. I mean, I think that's what the machine or transformation test 
in, in some sense is, is doing, right? It's excluding the intangible stuff. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, to some extent also the, the mental steps uh, 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 piece uh, 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 does that. Um, but I'm not sure that excluding information uh, has, you know, again, depending on what your account is of what it is that patentable subject matter boundaries are doing, I'm not sure that information, the status of an invention as information, correlates with any distinct, uh, you know, subject matter boundaries interest. Um, uh, so, I, but, but I think that uh, uh, the machine or transformation test is quite compatible with a view of the patent right. system that excludes information from protection. You mentioned that the method in Myriad will likely be invalidated. Is that at the transformation level or the exclusion for abstract ideas? Well, I don't know if I said likely, but I think it's more likely to be more likely than the, than the product claims. So you're saying at the level of? Well, there's obviously a determination there. You mentioned that some kind of chemical transformation is. It could be seen essential to the claim method, and not some mere data gathering step. But it's not, in the, it's not in the claim is the problem. I think that what might happen um, uh, is what might happen in the future is that people will say a method that consists of obtaining a DNA sample, blah, 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 and then they'd be fine. They didn't do that here. They just went straight to, um, uh, uh, what do they say here, analyzing a sequence, right? So the, uh, the, that, that possibly transformative step lurks in the past, but it didn't make it into the claim. So Prometheus might not help Satisfied in because there's not that exact determination step spelled out. Exactly. So it, you know, and there's a, there's a bunch of different claims, and it might be that there are some claims in uh, in, in these in these patents that will survive under that approach. Uh, but this is an example of one that probably wouldn't, and there's a bunch of them that wouldn't. I think. Yeah. Sorry to bounce back, but so let's say that you're right about the composition of matter claims being reversed. The claims that you looked at would correlate to one and two, which are actually only claims to the full-length gene, and would not prevent anybody from doing a diagnostic test that didn't include that entire sequence. The other claims that are subordinate and for shorter segments, I would argue, are highly vulnerable. Way more vulnerable, probably even than the right, method claims. Right, just under, claims. Pure prior, just under of prior, prior art. Yeah. And there's a huge gap between those claims and the very small fragment claims that seems to be free up an awful lot of space. What happens if those disappear and you're left with only these full full length cDNA claims and a lot of freedom to operate? A lot of claims get invalidated, and we have to go back through and figure out which ones are valid from which patents. Is that? Yeah, I mean, you know. Um, uh, Myriad has many patent claims in its quiver. You know, they haven't all been challenged. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're out here trying to establish some point, and so they're picking off the most vulnerable uh, uh, claims. So I don't know. I mean, I haven't done an analysis of their patent portfolio to see how much they would still be able to control. Um, uh, but I think, I, I mean, I, I basically I agree with your intuition that the method claims are going to be, especially looking forward, are more important. Yeah. And so if those get... If if justice if Judge Sweet is affirmed as to those claims, that would be a big deal for Myriad. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to all of our speakers and participants for uh, shedding light on a very important and, and complex topic. I imagine uh, we'll love to have you back in days and months to come to rehash and, and, and see what is, uh, what is happening. This is uh, unbelievably quickly uh, moving compared to the old days. You know, it used to be that an edition of a patent law book was like a real property book. You could wait every 30 years or so to get another edition. But now things are moving so quickly that uh, we get to see each other more, uh, which, is, which is a good thing. So uh, thanks uh, to all of you for coming. Thanks very much to the students of Jolti for organizing this great conference.